tear down and bring in everything that we had set up for the outdoor mass, the thought occurred to me that the Christians of the first uh, couple of centuries were probably used to having to scramble at the last minute to change their location to avoid the Roman soldiers. So for us to do this to avoid the rain kind of uh, puts things in perspective, does it not? Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. You know, when you come right down to it, and we just read this, of course, uh, Daniel just read it for us from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. Again, when you come right down to it, that is really an astonishing admonition to us from the Apostle Paul. Let this mind be in you, which was in the Son of God. Think about that. We've talked many times about how the call to discipleship, the call to walk in a close spiritual relationship with Jesus, friendship with Christ, is also a call to identify intimately with both his person and his nature. But even that, even that thought doesn't really fully express what Paul is communicating in here. Again, he says, have this mind, this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. In other words, what he's saying to us is, let Jesus' mind be your mind. That sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the same St. Paul says this, who has the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, he says. Now, this goes to the very heart of the concept in Romans chapter 12, where Paul instructs us, do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed, how? He says, by the renewal of your mind. So do you get it? Do you see the consistency of Paul's teaching on this subject of our minds? As we've said so many times before, the Christian walk lies in you and I, day by day, week by week, year by year, becoming more like Jesus, conformed to his image, as Romans 8 puts it. And that implies that each of us who call ourselves Christians takes the responsibility for allowing God, by his Spirit, to transform us into the image of his Son. And one of the cumulative effects of all those individual transformations, you and you and you and you and me, all of those together, is then that, that that corporately, our church, our very parish is transformed into a living organism, we could say, that manifests the life and love and power of the risen Christ to the world. And after all, isn't that our call as Christians, as Catholics? God has always impacted the world through his people, through his chosen people Israel in the Old Testament, and through his body, the church today. It has always been true, and it will continue to be true until Jesus returns. But the caveat in all of this is that all of the human talent, excellence, ingenuity, and resources in the world cannot accomplish what the Lord calls us to accomplish. Because sooner or later, everything and anything that is built on that earthly, temporal footing will fail. If you don't believe that, look around you today. What we're experiencing is the massive failure of those things right now on a global scale. What Paul calls us to when he urges us to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, is something that is not by any means earthly, nor, by the way, is it easy. It's not easy because it specifically requires the development of a virtue that is far from easy for us proud human beings, the virtue of humility. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who did what? Humbled himself, 
This humbling of Jesus began with an action which St. Paul describes in verse 7 as emptying himself, emptying himself. This humble self-emptying was the fruit of God's unbounded love for mankind. As we read, for example, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. The love of the father required a response of humility from the son. Humility so complete that the son who was equal with the father, fully God in every respect, emptied himself. It's hard for us to imagine that, isn't it? He emptied himself in humility that was manifested very clearly in the lowly circumstances, for example, of his birth in a borrowed stable, in an obscure village, as well as in all the circumstances of his 33 years on earth. And ultimately, it was humility that it was so complete that it motivated Jesus to be obedient to the will of the Father, even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. About two weeks ago, the church celebrated the feast of the triumph of the Holy Cross. Think of that concept, the triumph of the cross, triumph born of loving humility. It's very counterintuitive, isn't it? Triumph born of loving humility that led to death on the cross. Love so strong that the Father would send Jesus, for God so loved the world. And humility so complete that Jesus would obey even to the excruciating and humiliating death of the cross. It's likely that there are only a few of you who are here this morning who would be familiar with the name Thomas Vanderwoody of Noakesville, Virginia. I've spoken about him before, I've told you this story before, but it bears repeating in this context. Thomas Vanderwoody, at age 66, had lived a life of self-sacrifice to others. Early in his adult life, he had been a combat pilot in Vietnam, and later a commercial airlines pilot. But it was in his relationships with his family, his church, and his community that his humble sense of self-sacrifice was most apparent. One who knew him best said he was the kind of guy that would gladly give you the shirt off of his back, and if he didn't have one on, he would go and buy one for you. He and his wife of 43 years had seven children, all boys. He volunteered for years as coach of the soccer and basketball teams, <coughs> excuse me, at the local Catholic high school that all of his sons attended. He also volunteered his time as the sacristan of his parish church, where he also trained the altar servers. But those who were closest to him knew him best for his faithful devotion to his youngest son, Joseph. Joseph had Down syndrome. He was 20 years old when what I'm about to tell you took place. Tom Vanderwoody and his son Joseph were inseparable. People said, wherever you saw Tom, you saw Joseph. They were together one fateful day in 2008 in the backyard of their rural Virginia home when Joseph stepped on the wooden cover over the septic tank in their backyard. The cover gave way, dropping Joseph into the deep tank. Without hesitating for a second, Tom Vanderwoody jumped into the tank after his son and submerged himself under his son so that he could push the young man up from below and keep his head above the watery muck. When rescue workers arrived, they pulled both men out of the tank and rushed them to the hospital where where Tom Vanderwoody was pronounced dead. 
but where his son Joseph eventually recovered and is alive to this day. Loving humility, humble love. Think about this. Someone sacrificing himself to die a horrible death in order to lift one he loved up from certain death to safety. Does that sound familiar? It should. When I first heard that story, my mind immediately went to Psalm 40, which has this line in it. He drew me up from the desolate pit and out of the miry bog. Speaking of Jesus, of course. Have this mind among yourselves which was in Christ Jesus. What mind was in Christ Jesus? A mind steeped in humility. Have this mind among yourselves, Paul says, a mind of godly humility. In its simplest terms, godly humility finds its source in my relationship with God in Christ Jesus and my honest re recognition of who he is and who I am. I need to constantly view God as he really is, all holy, all good, all majestic, all wise, all knowing, all powerful, immortal, transcendent, and so forth. And I need constantly to view myself as I really am, namely, none of that. The place then where true humility is birthed is under God's mighty hand, as 1 Peter 5 tells us. But under his mighty hand is also the place of safety, because God is who he is. His weakness is mightier than my strength. His foolishness is wiser than my wisdom. He is the creator. I am the created. He is God. And here's our news flash. Wait for it. I am not. But in spite of that, God gives me the sometimes fearsome gift of my free will. I often say that free will is at the same time one of the most beautiful and most fearsome gifts that God has endowed human beings with because we have freedom to choose to walk our own way in the pride of our human hearts or to walk in his way in humility and obedience. In that context then, walking in humility before God involves the ongoing conscious rejection, in fact, the renunciation of my own selfish personal agenda in order to embrace simple, humble, obedience to Christ. That kind of humility emanates from the understanding that God has a rightful claim on my life, on my very being, and that I am a fallible mortal creature and that God is the master of all that is, including the master of my life and my eternal destiny. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, St. Paul tells us this very emphatically. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Again, in its simplest terms, to be humble is to have the mind of Christ and thus progressively to take on the character of Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. Again in 1 Peter 5, St. Peter declares, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he goes on to say that when we humble ourselves before him, he will exalt us in due time. Contrary to the world's perspective, which views humility as the fear of losers, God's design brings about not a loss, but a gain in our lives. 
because it is, the po- is in the posture of humility that God pours out his grace in our lives. Grace, that wonderful, intangible gift we defined as, defined as God's unmerited favor. And although we know that it is truly unmerited, we also know from God's word that it is bestowed on us in the context of our humility. Thomas Akempis wrote in The Imitation of Christ, quote, God walks with the humble. He reveals himself to the lowly. He gives understanding to the little ones. He discloses his meaning to pure minds, but he hides his grace from the proud. I want to suggest that you and I resolve in our hearts today to seek to understand, to really understand humbly how spiritually empty we are in comparison with the surpassing greatness of God. And then to acknowledge God's unfathomable love for us in creating us in his image in redeeming us by his blood, and in inviting us to share in his very nature by calling us to friendship with Jesus. And why do we need to understand all that? So that we will have the motivation to become so desperate for God's filling us with his grace that everything else Everything that the world offers pales by comparison. Nothing else, nothing, will satisfy our own spiritual longing other than a genuine discovery of the person of Jesus, a discovery that will ultimately transform us into his likeness. And so I ask you this morning, brothers and sisters, and I'll close with this question. Ask yourself, in the quietness of your own heart, is there something going on in your life right now that could possibly represent God's humbling process in your life? If the answer is yes, then I encourage you, don't push back. Submit to it. It is preparation. It is a prologue to your walking ever more worthy of the calling to which you were called and to fulfilling God's plan and purpose in your life. Have this mind among you, which was in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.